So this is a, a picture downloaded from the airplane that's in the Air Force Museum. It's tail 787. You can see it right here. And there's a funny story behind it. This airplane never flew right. You take a four ship to the range. And if we were doing 45 degree rocket passes, you'd roll in work and the entire way around the pattern, you're working your way back up to base altitude for the next pass. This airplane could never meet that altitude in one circuit around. So you'd have to take a second one. And they sent it back to Rockwell a number of times because they thought, all right, it must weigh too much or it doesn't make enough power. They could never figure out what was wrong with it. So when the museum said, we'd like an OV-10, here you go. It was the first one they got rid of. <clears throat> and here's the disappointing thing about this museum airplane. This is a standard B8 or M2 stick grip. That's not the right stick grip for the OV-10. It had its own distinct stick grip. Why did they put this on there? I have no idea. They even stuck one in the rear cockpit and they didn't have one there either. I'm gonna go through a general layout of the cockpit and then we're gonna come back and, uh, and do the details on the switches. This is a civilian operated OV-10, I think pretty currently. Uh, how can I tell? Well, the weapons stations boxes are missing. Um, judging by the uniforms here, these are they're probably being used for forest fire control. They they use them as the lead ship to bring the drop airplanes in. And we'll also point out, see this thermometer here? We used to call it the turkey thermometer. Um, they took it out of the one in the museum, apparently afraid that, oh, well, that's a sharp object on the outside and somebody might get hurt. No. <laughs> really? <laughs> Here's another view. Again, it's got the wrong stick grip. There's the site. And I, I, have a, I have some detailed pictures that we'll go over in a little bit. That's the only picture I could find anywhere that was worth using of the left console of the airplane. Um, and we'll come back to it again. But in general, electrical and start panel, the throttle quadrant, flap, alternate flap, and alternate trim, and FM radio, the intercom panel, and the HF radio, and it had a G-suit. And that's where that thermometer should be, and they took it out. And there's the right panel. And this picture came from the Air Force Museum, but I'm thinking it may be a civilian airplane because there's another intercom panel here on the right, and it shouldn't be there because normally you flew with your right hand, and the wafer switch, as you selected between the five different radios, you needed a hand free to work that thing. And that would be your left hand. So I'm not sure if this is why it's there, but that's the right console. All right. So you're asking about the seats. The airplane actually had a very good seat. It was a North American design called the LW three B lightweight three B. And <clears throat> I read a story just a few days ago. One of the prototypes was, was doing some test work and they had a problem when they tried to come back in to land they lost control of it yeah. and it pitched down and they were inverted below 400 feet and both guys lived wow. now and this is not a seat like the martin baker seats that know which way is up and can steer themselves the way uh north american made the seat very capable was they said Okay, the, the seats for jets have a two to three second delay between the pilot chute, which is a small chute to stabilize the seat, and the main chute, so that the main chute doesn't get ripped to shreds if you're going out at high speed. And they said, well, we don't need a delay in this seat because they're never going to go that fast. So they reduced the, the time delay between uh, seat ejection and chute deployment. So, Steve-O, uh, how, how do you get in this airplane? You showed See, some side, little steps, didn't you? Yeah. So, it's, it's a side-hinged window, right? There's one for each side. You see this thing, this 
little bracket here on the top of the seat, that's the canopy breaker because that's how you went out. It, the, it always mm. broke the glass to get you out. It, was, it wasn't very thick. It was only about no, I mean, three sixteenths of an inch, I'd say. And um, th that actually changed something that I did in the airplane. <clears throat> when I flew the airplane, they said, don't fly the mask, fly the boom mic. Well, I found the boom mic noisy because it picked up the sound of the props. The OB-10 cockpit, because you were between the two props, was the noisiest cockpit in the Air Force, 120 decibels. Wow. And so we were required to wear foam earplugs underneath the helmet. So I thought, you know what? I can hear better. I can hear other people better when they wear a mask. So I'm going to wear my mask because my primary job is communication. I also liked having the mask on so that if I wanted to go above 10,000 feet, I had oxygen. But I also started thinking, you know, having the mask on would probably protect my face a little bit more if there's a jagged piece of plastic still there on my way out. So that's what that was about. Does that, does that answer all the questions on the seat? Or? It does, so, so, but I've got more. Sure, go ahead. So, so it answers some of the questions. So no, it doesn't answer all the questions. Um, so zero, zero capability? Oh, yes. I, um, I, and I looked it up just to be sure. Um, zero, zero. And and what was the what were the sort of parameters in flight? Um, was it very restrictive in terms of sync rate? You know, at degrees of roll, um, that kind of thing. I mean, did it well, have like the same I said, performance? Those guys got out in fully inverted below four hundred feet and lived. That was pretty impressive to me. Yeah. Had, I, they, I, had they tucked under and were climbing back up again in in the inverted position, or were they was it with the developed sync rate or? No, it it fired them at the ground and and they got to shoot so quickly. They wow. actually got to shoot before they hit the ground. Wow. Yeah, it's, that's pretty impressive. And it's only because of that delay, because if there had been that three-second delay, they'd have probably hit the ground first. And and so you've got an ejection. I saw the one between your legs uh, in the previous <laughs> shot, but it looks like there's one on the left-hand side of the headrest there. Is that is that for that, or is that something else? That, I'm trying to remember what that is. It's it's not an ejection handle, though. It's, um, I think that is to... Um, disconnect a quick disconnect to get out of the airplane for egress okay i forgot to look that one up next we're going to see the back seat <clears throat> um, this is an armor plate and the, the floor had some some of these plates like it too i think it's aluminum about three-eighths of an inch thick uh, for small arms protection once again they've put a standard b8 stick grip in here and the real stick grip in the OB-10 in the back seat didn't even have a trim button. It didn't have a pickle button. It, it had nothing. So somebody just decided to put these grips in there because I guess they had nothing else. Um, a few of the airplanes were modified with trim buttons and weapon stuff up here, but not in the conventional sense. What about, um, you've mentioned the armor then, survivability features built built into the aeroplane than spike i don't know if that's something you're going to come to but you think about the a10 manual reversion multiple systems redundancy the ability to take hits keep going um so that's obviously for a cas aircraft but uh, but you kind of think well fac a how, how how different is it you're very close not, to the, yeah, you're very exactly. close to the ground getting shot at um, close um to the you know this is nice and the plates on the floor are nice but what's this it's warm butter. Wow. So, and what about all this? Yeah. So there's, it's Swiss cheese with a whole lot of holes in it. So, uh, but the, but the flight controls were just direct cable. And I believe they're duplicated on both sides. I'm going to show a picture of that in, at, towards the end. Um, mm. So, he, I mean, none of the flight controls were hydraulic in any sense. Right. So, there was still a lot of controllability even if the thing was shot up. The, the biggest weakness would be, did you get shot up? Yeah. All right, here's a, a page out of the Dash 1 that labels all the bits and pieces. And here we go. 
think we'll do this like I did with the F4. We'll start on the left side and work our way around. Mm -hmm. So right here, we've got the throttle quadrant. This lever here, if it was forward, is a friction lock. So you could adjust the tightness for the, the two throttles. Mm -hmm. So for a turboprop airplane, these are the condition levers. Condition levers have the function of fuel on and off and how the propeller operates in response to the throttles. So the way the OV-10 was operated, for takeoff or landing, these levers were all the way forward, and the prop would spin at its maximum RPM all the time and just stay at that RPM. When you move the throttles, it would change the amount of fuel going to the engine, and so to keep the RPM the same, it would change the blade pitch. And so... It, Essentially, it gives instantaneous thrust response. There's no RPM lag. Does that make sense? Mm, yeah, it does. Okay. Now, in flight, if you didn't want to listen to wah, 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 you could work these back to normal flight. And, and now, when you move the throttles, not only did it change power, but it also changed RPM within a, a range. The one thing they didn't teach us at, at Patrick, everybody always imitated the props being out of sync like that, going the wah, 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 wah. And everyone, everyone was afraid to touch the damn things. They said, oh, shit, I move it too much. What happens? I don't know. I think the engines will quit. So one day I was flying an airplane. It just, it was driving me crazy. And so I just pulled one of the condition levers, the fast engine back an eighth of an inch. And so then, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, oh my God, I should have been doing this two years ago. <laughs> um, and so I started teaching guys that too, but um, they didn't teach it to us for some reason. Here's the throttles. Uh, that's the mic button. Up to transmit out, up and out as we used to say, and down for intercom. This is the electrical panel and start panel. I'll, I have another picture to go over in more detail, but in essence, the two guarded switches are for auto feather. <clears throat> so if, if the engine sensed that it had just quit, in other words, it's being a, a windmill instead of a propeller, it would automatically feather itself. Uh, these are the two start switches. That's the inverter, which turns DC power into AC and had both a number one and a number two position. That's the battery switch. And those are the generator switches. I might as well talk about this now. So when we would shut down, the, the OB-10 had reverse pitch for landing. So you'd touch down and it would release a, a, a squat switch would release a gate in the throttles and you could now pull the the, the throttles backward in reverse thrust. And it made this hideous sound because literally what was happening was it, the blades were stalling, but it made reverse thrust. So you touch it, mm, wah! it sounded awful. Well, when you'd go to the chocks to shut down, you'd hold it in reverse thrust. You'd use your condition levers to shut down the engine. And as the RPM decayed and oil pressure was before oil pressure was lost, three little spring-loaded uh, locks would move in the propeller hub so that when those blades moved from reverse pitch, they'd go clunk, 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 and they're at flat pitch. Why? Because the blades had to be at flat pitch to start because it's the easiest way to swing the propeller. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Well, what if somebody shut it down and the thing was in feather? Well, now that's the hardest thing to turn to start it. And so you'd lift these guarded switches and it's got on, auto, and crank. Crank meant you'd, if you held the switch in the crank position with the throttle pulled back into reverse, it would pull the thing back and you'd hear clunk, clunk, clunk as the three locks locked in a position. Now the prop is in flat pitch. Now you can start it. Nice. I think I only had to do that once or twice. And it's because somebody shut it down wrong. Uh, standard gear handle, a little bit different. It's got a little squeeze lever on the top that you had to squeeze to retract the gear. I'd forgotten this. I had to look it up. That's the flap gauge. 
coincident with the, the gear indicators. Tri uh, elevator trim, and then we had a green light for the rudder and aileron trim. Didn't tell you which way it was, just told you if it was neutral. Clock, G meter, standby ADI. Continuous ignition. Uh, the OV-10 was in a, a, the four military airplanes that I flew. Uh, three of them you weren't supposed to fly in ice at all, including the OV-10, because it, you could get ice in the air intake and, well, it would quit. But if you were in heavy rain or if you accidentally flew in ice, you could put the continuous ignition on. Tack, -ins, uh, tack in and VOR switch for the instrument that's behind the stick. Stores jettison button, which would have normally only dropped the centerline tank, as I recall. Guns. So I mentioned the guns. Um, it could carry four 30 caliber machine guns. And I only, I only carried two on two flights at Patrick. It was just a familiarization event. Um, I thought they were going to have this big, massive sound like machine guns in the movies. And instead it sounded like pop, 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 pop. The instructor opened the panel on the sponsor to show me the gun. And I kid you not, they are a standard army 30 caliber machine gun with the wooden stock removed. Right. It even still has the little finger trigger, except now there's a little electric plunger thing that pushes the trigger to fire the gun. <laughs> so we used to joke that if we ever got shot down, remember this is in the 80s, you tear your sponson open, rip the gun out with the belts, and go Rambo through the through the jungle. <laughs> well, anyway, that's what these switches are for, uh, to arm the guns on the sponsons. And I fired them at Patrick on two flights. All I hit was the swamp, and we never saw the guns again. Did we have them at George? I don't know. This one, it says Mark IV pod. So apparently there was another gun that could have been carried underneath, but I don't even know anything about it. If you were carrying actual bombs, like Mark 82, here's nose tail fusing select, and here's master arm. This is a map container. Um, it might contain your facking maps, but it usually contained instrument type stuff. These are the weapon station select switches. So this one here is the center. That's where the fuel tank was. And these would be, these two adjacent would be the sponson stations. And then if the airplane was modified to carry weapons under the wing, that's what these would be. This is a <clears throat> over torque light. So if you were asking for more power than the engine was rated at, the orange light would come on. And if, if there was an overheat inside the nacelle, then an overheat light. There's also fire pull handles to go with that. Uh, we're going to go over the UHF radio in detail in a little bit, but that used to be what every UHF radio looked like in every tactical airplane. <clears throat> Airspeed indicator currently placarded at 350 knots, standard drum and pointer altimeter. Uh, Tack and power, alternate tack and power, wheels warning light if, if it thought you should be geared down and you weren't. A fire detect and warning lights test switch. The tack and control head is back here behind the stick. And down here, this was hard to find because it, it's covered in a dash 34, not in the dash one. Modified airplanes could carry AIM-9s. Mm. And I didn't even know any of ours were, but at least they put the panel in here. So it's got a safe missile one and missile two, a, a red guarded jettison switch, the volume control for the seeker head. And this is where you really see the age of the airplane coolant on. It used to be that to shoot a, a heater, you had to tell the, the coolant when to activate so that the sneaker head would be cold enough that it could detect the target. And it was a limited amount of that gas that was available to cool the head, so you didn't want to turn it on too early. Um, but that's what's down there. This 
is apparently is a fire agent to put either in the left engine or the right. And I have a, a drawing here in a minute, an older one. So apparently this was retrofitted to the airplanes. That is a mode four warning light that would illuminate if interrogations are received, but no reply is given. Turn and slip, VSI, unlike modern airplanes where the ILS would be part of a flight director over in here, it was a, it was the simple thing that we had right here. We've got engine torque gauges measured in foot pounds and percent RPM of the, of the core of the engine. Uh, EGT, fuel quantity, oil pressure. Here are three fuel transfer switches. So again, I never saw wing drop tanks, but these two outboard switches were for wing transfer fuel. The center one, yeah, we use that all the time. Uh, let's see. This is a test switch for the gauge to, see, to test both the feed tank and the main fuel tank for quantity. You could switch between one or the other. And here's emergency fuel shutoff switches. Pedo heat, self-explanatory. Cockpit air or defrost. That's, this is a pull slider uh, control. And it basically either decided if the air came out of these eyeball vents, there's one here and there's another one up by the site. Or if it came out at the base of the windscreen in case you were fogging up. Temperature, pretty self-explanatory. It, it put engine bleed air into the mix. But the OV-10 had no air conditioner at all. And so when you pulled this ram air lever, a big flat plate about the width of that center windscreen panel, so I'd call it about a foot wide and about three to four inches this way, it just popped up into the air and it scooped fresh Mojave desert air into the cockpit for you. <laughs> and that's why when guys are saying, hey, Spike, they're getting ready to test out the OP-10 in Afghanistan. I said, oh, no, <laughs> it'll be hot. Also trying to fly over those mountains, single engine would not be very good. The, the OB-10A that I flew had very poor single engine performance in hot weather. Victorville, was 2,800 feet above sea level. And if the outside air temperature, remember the temperature gauge over here, if it was hotter than 90 degrees, and that was a lot in Victorville, a lot of the time, our single engine ceiling, if you did everything right, was never better than 2,000 feet above sea level. In other words, it was 800 feet underground. Wow. Now, the marine airplanes, they had a lot more power and they'd probably do better, but they also added more weight to them. So I'm not sure how their performance was single engine. All right, what else we got down here? Uh, the anti-collision or red beacon light, formation lights. We didn't do that much night formation. And I think it's a white tail light. Oxygen regulator, which is similar to just about every other airplane. And the transponder panel, which I'll go over in a minute. Again, this used to be the standard transponder in every tactical airplane. All right, next. This is that older drawing, and I'm including it here to show not a whole lot changed, but that fire agent discharge switch, not there. So they must have added it after Vietnam. And this is that missile control panel. So safe, missile two, one, missile two, missile jettison, volume control for the And that's the coolant switch. And this is the volt ammeter, which I'd forgotten about down here up behind the stick. Apparently, there was a switch. You had to switch which generator you were wanting to measure at any time. Now, we're going to go over warning lights. Yeah. yeah, we'll just jump ahead. So, standard red light in the gear handle if the gear wasn't down or if it thought you should have it down and weren't. So, in other words, if you had flaps down... Uh, and below a certain speed, or if um, if the condition levers weren't in takeoff and land, that type of thing. 
already covered the over torque and the nacelle high temperature lights, fire, uh, fire pull handle lights, wheels warning light. I had to look these up. I'd forgotten. Um, I told you the flight controls are all direct linkage. And the only hydraulics in the airplane were for nose wheel steering and gear retraction. And it was an electrically driven pump and it was only on demand. So normally when we taxi this thing, you use differential power. You, I mean, you could push up one throttle and pull the other one back into a little bit of reverse and maybe a little bit of tap of the, of the brake on the inside of the turn. The nose wheel would pivot and away you'd go. But every now and then you'd have to use nose wheel steering. Well, anytime you blip the nose wheel steering button, that green light should come on. Oh, I forgot the flaps are hydraulic too. So if the flaps were moving, that light would come on. This amber one is saying, I don't have it. The pressure was low while the pump was running. Not that many warning lights compared to the Phantom. I've actually got my, my Phantom warning panel over here, and it's probably got 40 different lights on it. Uh, the fuel feed tank was a small tank in the center section right behind the rear seat. And according to the book, it, if uh, the feed tank got below 20 pounds of gas, the light came on. That's not very much. Left generator, right generator light, self-explanatory. Fuel low was 200 pounds of gas. Spoiler authority. I didn't even remember that one. The book says it was disabled. And apparently that was um, a light that was created before they expanded the wings and added the ailerons just to show that something was wrong with the spoilers. Instrument power means that the Inverter is dead, so you want to switch the other inverter. Boost pumps, it says engine failure is likely. Well, what it means is the main fuel pump doesn't have the pressure it needs to keep the engine running. Start ignition light. Whenever you start the engines, this light would come on, but it was unnecessary because you could hear it in your headset. It had this uh, voltage build up sound, and we go beep, 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 beep. And if you didn't hear that when you when you tried to start the airplane, it hot for it. So funny story, we were cross country. We were at uh, Shepherd Air Force Base. Sure enough, our left engine, it's cranking, but we don't hear the sweep. And so I'm a lieutenant. The, the guy I'm flying with is an experienced captain. He'd been flying them at Simbach. So he tells our wingman, shut down. I got to go. I got to go beat on it. So we go inside the left wheel well, and we've got big wooden chocks for the tires. And on the back of the engine was a white box about the size of a, oh, of a first aid kit that someone would carry in the boot of their car. With a big sticker on it, it said, engine ignition module, do not strike. Well, that is exactly where John Skinner started beating on it with the wooden chalk. We got back in and it started. And I thought, so it really means strike here. <laughs> I think I tried that one other time and it worked. It's amazing. Um, these two, left chip and right chip lights. Those are two of the scariest lights you could have in a turboprop airplane. Um, you know how they work? Yeah, there's, there's metallic particles on them. The yeah, because they've got a magnet in the oil in the oil pan and if it attracts iron particles it bridges the gap and turns the light on that's bad yeah all right next so here's the uhf radio and i thought this might be worth a discussion because it shows how the have it shows some of the features of a have quick radio you've heard of that mm -hmm. okay and again this is what they always look like so this is a little flip up panel that had the listings of what was in preset channels one through 20. You know, I would say channel one is 254.1. When you got to the airplane every day, well, you would, you would, um, we tuned to a command post frequency that put, that transmitted a time of day. You'd twist it to T and let go. Now the radio was armed to receive this beep boop. Now the radio is coordinated to the same uh, time reference that all the other radios are on. 
And then you would say, you know, whatever net you go to. And if it's in A like this, that means it's in a half quick mode. If you wanted to be on a different net, you just change the numbers here. It's a pretty good system. You mentioned you mentioned um, you mentioned word of day. Did, was there a word of day with the, with the system then? Just a time of day. Yeah, and no, I'm trying. To, I can't remember how to do it now. Oh, I remember. It, you'd go to channels twenty. You started. You'd have to put something in channel twenty as though it was a frequency that armed nineteen through fifteen. It, and then you'd look on your book and it'd say put put in what looks like a frequency, and then hit the set button. And you were really programming a computer, even though it uh, looked like you were programming frequencies. Okay. Wow, I'm, su I'm surprised I dredged that one up. Main means the uh, whatever frequency is here. Both means you're also getting guard channel, 243.0. Um, ADF didn't work. Tone button, if you pressed it, if you were in have quick, it transmitted the time of day. So if your buddy said, give me a Mickey, which means a Mickey Mouse watch, you press a button and it would go beep, beep. squelch on and off. Uh, the best way to explain squelch is you must be this tall to be heard on this radio. <laughs> so there's always background radio noise. And if it's weak stuff, it doesn't get through that level. But if you're trying to hear somebody that's really far away, you might need to turn the squelch off to hear him. You're also going to hear the background noise. And manual means you're getting this frequency. Preset means you're getting that. And guard means you're on guard. Uh, that's just a uh, another thing showing the uh, simplistic. There's plenty of heat in the OV-10. There's not a whole lot of cold. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that the Marine ones had a limited air conditioning capacity, but... The problem is with engines that small, there's just not a lot of bleed air available to actually work an air conditioner. And when you've got such a, a huge amount of plexiglass to act as a greenhouse, yeah. not too effective. All right, here's the site. So this knob right here, and I'd completely forgotten this, sliding this back and forth sets the mill settings right here that you need for that attack. So in our smart book, the in-flight guide, <clears throat> we'd have different mill settings for the day for various temperatures, for uh, pressure altitudes on what we we're trying to do. <clears throat> so you'd set that and here's the combining glass and the lens was down here. <clears throat> Let me go to, and there's another one of those eyeball lens. I think the next picture shows what I want to show. They show the mill depression knob over here on the side, even though it looked like it was up there in the previous. We talked about the um, the weapons panel here, but what I really wanted to talk about was this panel up here. And I got this down. The OB-10 had a smoke generator, and it usually worked. This was a spring-loaded switch. If you held it up, it shot smoke oil into the left exhaust stack, and the idea was if you were trying to get the fighters to see you and they couldn't see you, uh, make a smoke trail. Wow. Well, what would we do? We'd go out and do loops with a smoke generator running. And, you know, I mean, if it was today, you know, you could draw stuff like the Navy draws and then get in trouble for it. <laughs> um, I'd forgotten about this one. Warning horn disabled. And the only warning horn we had was for the gear. So if the horn was blaring at you, you'd pull that down and it would shut it up. This I had to research. Fire dropping off. Some of the airplanes were modified to carry chaff and flares. I never saw any on the airplane. And I'm not sure exactly. It was a complicated system. Somehow it used the Noseville steering button to do chaff and flares. But, I mean, look at it. This is from the official flight manual. And it's obvious someone just did that with ink and and a correcto type <laughs> this i didn't remember at all <clears throat> apparently there was some kind of a big strike camera package that fit in the rear seat i think it somehow stuck out through the floor so these lights this one says a uh, power on for camera extend and this one says end of film 
Uh, I'd completely forgotten about that. This is filament select number one and number two because the bulb for the site was one bulb and it had two filaments. Mm. This turned the gun sight on and off and it's a bright dim knob as well. Now we got the rear cockpit. This is a modified one. Basically, it's, it's showing that if it's one of the airplanes that's got trim and all these other things in the rear cockpit, He's got all these other stations, but it's just a repeat of the stuff I covered on the front of the panel. Here's a nice view of the rocket pod, since we're talking about weapons. This is the back end. So you can see the little contactor pin that would touch the rocket in the middle. Uh, seven rockets. Um, I'm not sure why this blocking plate is here, unless that means that that tube is bad. Don't load one. This is the front edge of the uh, of the pod. And this is the one in the museum, and so it's got a good view of those machine guns. And again, it's literally an, an infantryman's machine gun, just with the wooden stock removed. And that's what the front of the rockets looked like. <clears throat> we were getting new rockets right as I left the TAS. They were called CRV sevens. They were a Canadian rocket. And they had about 75% more range than the ones that we'd been shooting. They were mm -hmm. phenomenal. And they were much faster, so they were, they were much less prone to tip off under G when they came out of the tube. And we would practice high threat casts by flying low, pulling up, and lofting a rocket, and then hoping it came somewhere close to the target area. And... With the, what are they called? Mark threes, I think. Oh, you could get about a, I think it was a nine kilometer loft with the old rockets. I think they were getting something like 15 or 16 kilometers out of the new rockets. Uh, and I thought that would actually potentially be survivable. Yeah. Anyway, that's what it looked like. Uh, I included this only to show this is what the stick grip should really look like and not the B-8 like you would see in an F-86 or an F-4 or an old T-38. And there's another picture of one in a civilian-operated aircraft. All right. Now we're going to talk about the left console. <clears throat> so, again, uh, we're going to go through each panel using a, a, a close-up, but... Electrical and start, flap, alternate flap, trim, and alternate trim, and radios in the column. Now here's a pick from the dash one. A drawing to zoom in. And away we go. So electrical start. This is what I was talking about with the feathering control. Normally, Da guarded down was the thing in uh, in auto and if you needed to crank the prop back into flat pitch so you could start you lifted the guard held it in crank and pulled that particular throttle back into reverse start you would push it forward into start wait for i think 10 percent rpm turn the condition lever on and get a light off if it was a bad start pull it back to abort and away you go Inverter select one and two, and generators on, reset, and off. Battery on, I don't remember what emergency did that okay. was different than just on. And there's a picture of it again, and it looks like there's a little bit of rust on this airplane. They, it could use a little bit of tender love and care. All right, here's the flap and trim panel. <clears throat> which is the next one behind the throttle quadrant. I'd forgotten about this. So there's an external lights master switch. And it's a, that's a pretty good idea, actually. If you're in combat and you want to be invisible, it's nice to have one switch to shut off all the lights so that the bad guys aren't shooting at you. Here's the rudder trim switch. And just to make sure that the uh, thinking impaired knew what it meant, nose left and nose right. <laughs> 
because they probably thought, wait, does that mean the rudder's going left or the rudder's going right? <laughs> Flap lever. Um, I believe you could put it in, if you put it in the down position and then put it in hold, it, you could stop it in any position you wanted. But otherwise, you just use the takeoff or the down detent. Trim select normal meant that the trim on the stick would work. Alternate meant you could use this four-way switch or the alternate rudder trim switch. Alternate flaps, I guess they were afraid that this thing wouldn't work. So up, down, and basically stop. And I'd completely forgotten that we had a yaw damper. I, I didn't remember that at all. Hmm. And so those alternate systems, are they running off of different circuits? Is it, is yeah. it like you've got two two motors I, to drive the flaps and one's on the alternate and the I others? Think, I think it's same motor, just different wire and a different switch, okay. I think. I'd be surprised if they had multiple motors to do that. Okay. All right. VHF comm, FM. So this is what the Army used. <laughs> FM had a distinctive sound to it. You'd, you'd hear the army go, one mic, Charlie, Alpha, two, two, tango. This is. He's looking down to figure out what his call sign is. This is zero, zero, Sierra, Bravo, Oscar. Over. Now the guy he called has to look down and remember what his call sign is. Oh my God, it was agonizing. Anyway, um, we had two FM radios, and their purpose was this was the only way we could normally talk to the Army. It's, um, it's below the commercial FM band, like for car radios. But it turns out it was in the citizens band in the States because <clears throat> we'd be doing a cast scenario, and we heard taxi cabs. <laughs> Saying, say, they said, hey, Car 44, can you go over to the Holiday Inn and pick up somebody? I said, can you use another frequency? And, yeah, I'm not here to the Holiday Inn. And so, um, you see the setting of tone right there? <laughs> we set it on tone one day and we calm jammed them. <laughs> what, does, what does that mean then? What do you do? What does tone oh, do? Oh, if uh, tone, if you keyed the mic, would just transmit boo. For a hold down. Uh, let's see. Anyway, the, relatively short range, probably 20-ish miles, maybe 30. But I think it, it can bounce a little bit in terrain, and I think that's why the Army liked to use it. Okay. So we had two of those. And I would argue that the intercom panel and the wafer switch was the most important part of the airplane. This, because this thing was spinning all the time. So typically, you know, you might be hot mic, you might be cold mic, but that's the intercom. UHF, it used to be that the only fighters that had VHF was the F-16 and then the A-10. Later, they, they started retrofitting it to almost everything. So this would be F-4s. Could be an F-16 or an A-10. This is the Army. This was useful for going into civilian fields where there was a lot of civilian traffic because now you're on the same frequencies as the light airplanes, the airliners, and everybody can hear everybody. And we could also, because of that, we could go into civilian uncontrolled airports and just play. Hmm. HF is you could call it short wave. And so in theory, I said, this was for fighters. That might be for fighters. That's for the army. This is for the Navy and to contact way back at headquarters, say at numbered air force or something. So let's say you're out in the field and you got some guys that are pinned down and there's no fighters available and they need help. Well, you're 200 miles from headquarters. How do you get them to send some fighters? Well, in theory, you'd use HF 
which can bounce off the ionosphere and go halfway around the world. The problem was I never got it to work. Oh, I'd hear it tune. You'd put in a frequency and key the mic and it'd go beep. Okay, it's tuned. I'd try calling the command post at George Air Force Base. They never heard me. The only time I got it to work, I called the command post in Honolulu, Hawaii. <laughs> and they said, say your position. I said, California. <laughs> That's the only time that worked. Um, I didn't cover this on the instrument panel, but we could tune in AM radio stations. Why? Well, if you're flying an OV-10 in a third world, not so great place, there's typically not a lot of VOR and TACAN stations for navigation, but there's lots of commercial radio stations. So you could use these and the ADF needle to navigate and even fly approaches. Or if you wanted to listen to tunes in the news, you could listen to that. Anyway, what we would typically do, oh, how did that happen? You'd have these things set at different volumes so that if you couldn't tell by the tone, you could tell by the volume who was talking to you. Uh, VHF is bright and clear. UHF has a more full and bassier sound to it. Uh, the FM always had that squelch break at the beginning and the end. And HF had kind of that calling line, this is Bangladesh. That's cool. It had that weird uh, phase shifter sound to it. The call button, I couldn't remember what that was. If the guy in the back seat was on cold mic and he had the volume turned down on the intercom, you could press this and it was going to override the volume and he'd hear you. But for crying out loud, you could have just turned around and said, hey, because you can see him and there's no glass between the two cockpits. All right, there's the HF radio. And... I mean, I got HF to work when I was doing the long range airline business, um, but it didn't seem to work too good in the OV-10. It's the long wire antenna coming down from the top of the tail to the top of the fuselage. All right, now we're gonna cover the right side. But in general, we've got the heating and lighting controls that we talked about earlier, oxygen panel, the standard or used to be standard transponder panel. There's that AM radio. This should have been the Victor radio, the VHF or another FM. The intercom panel should have been the side. Oh, I should have covered this. You know what that is? It's not a piddle tube. It's fine. <laughs> it is. Of course, they would try to tell the new guys, this is a Gosport tube. You can talk to the guy in the back seat if the intercom's out. Say, yeah, I ain't buying that. Um, I never used it. I knew somebody who tried once. There were guys that used to smoke in the airplane and they'd try to shove the cigarette butts down the tube. Well, so of course, our hapless victim tries pissing in this thing. And of course, it gets backed up and he ends up pissing all over his hand. So, oh, this back here is KY28, I think. It was a cipher radio thing to make it secure. Never used it in the OV 10. Tried to use it on one mission in Desert Storm in the F-4, and it didn't work then either. <laughs> Not a high level of confidence. All right, let's go to these. There's the drawing. There's the piss tube. Shadow drawing. Let's see, let me see if I got here. There we go. So we covered these switches up here before when we were talking about the heating and control stuff. That's the red beacon. Formation lights with little strip lights for uh, formation flying. And the tail light is at the very tip, I think, of the right um, kind of tail. Console lighting and instrument lighting, that's pretty self-explanatory. Flight instruments. Uh, the floodlight, I think there were a couple lights that were built in at the top of the arch. Can't remember. There's some high intensity floods that were basically bright white in case you got stuck in a thunderstorm so you wouldn't be flash blinded when you when that happened. And here's a switch for the standby compass at night. 
cargo bay light switch um, is for loading and unloading cargo at night. A standard Grimes light. And this is for the guys that had the extra stuff in the back seat. Here's that transponder. So, mode one, which you could set right here, at least during the Gulf War, uh, it rotated. So you take a, a document with you, and I think it was every three or four hours you had to change that code. Mode two is something to set by maintenance, typically. In the F4, it was inside a panel in the nose gear well. If you had a screwdriver and opened the door, you could check the code, but you couldn't change it in flight. Mode three is your standard air traffic control. And mode C is the altitude reporting. Mode four, which I understand they don't even have mode four anymore. Now they use, I think, five or six. Yeah. But it's a coded squawk, and it's only used basically by the U.S., Britain, Canada, Australia. New I don't Zealand. even know. If, and New Zealand. I don't even think Germany's got it. But it's it's held, the code is held electrically. It, it'd be set by... A maintenance guy before the flight and if you shut this thing off without holding the code it would be lost and so here's off standby low power normal power emergency meant it would squawk the emergency code of 7700 but if you went you went to shut it off you were supposed to hold it in hold so that the code didn't disappear if you were taking off near uh, midnight Zulu, you might be an A when you took off, but you might have to switch to the next day, which is the B code. Mm -hmm. And if you thought you were going to have to jump out of the airplane and bad guy land, you'd zero the code before you went just to make sure it was gone. There's a mode for on off switch. Usually you had it in light and you'd see the reply light blinking when it was doing its thing. But you could also put it in audio and it'd make a little beep. Compass controls and the tack in. Uh, the tack end head was behind the stick, and this, again, used to be a pretty standard tack end control head. That compass control, um, most military airplanes have what's called a flux gate, which is a magnetic sensor located far from most of the electrical power of the airplane. It's usually out in the wing. So it senses which way is magnetic north. It transmits a signal to the directional gyro on your panel. And this thing shows which way it thinks it needs to adjust it. If you get on the runway and you look at your HSI and it's said, whoa, that thing's off by 40 degrees, then you would put it in free, push this knob, turn the thing until the heading matched what it should be, and then put it back in slight. Mm -hmm. Or if you're in places where the magnetic variation is so ridiculous, such as Alaska, Washington State, any place with lots of volcanoes, which means there's lots of iron in the ground, it, the mag variation is usually pretty crazy. There's the VHF radio head. So comm was on one side and then VOR navigation on the other. It was different than most civilian radios in that our frequency range on comm went above the civilian uh, aviation band, we got into what was the police band and actually had the cops came and talked to us once and said, Hey, if you see any unusual activity, you can call us on this frequency. <laughs> Basically they were, they were suspecting drug smugglers of landing on dry lake beds out there near the base and dumping their loads. Said, if you see something like that, give us a holler. We'll, we'll send a chopper out there and go oh, check it out. Cool. Did you ever see anything? No. The only the only case I heard of was somebody saw something going on on a dry lake bed. I think it was in Lucerne Valley. They saw a B-17 on the lake bed. They said, what the hell? And there was a bunch of people and vehicles. So they called the cops. They were filming a scene for a movie. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Here's a rear cockpit. Um, 
again, pretty Spartan. That's what the stick looked like. It didn't have nose wheel steering, no trim, no pickle button, nothing. And I would like to point out that the rudder pedals did not say Rockwell. They did not say Boeing. They said North American Aviation. Nice. Like it should. 